I think the ongoing polarization of our country is making Donald Trump harder to beat in November. The fact is many Americans have regarded this impeachment process like a football game or a baseball game where you know what the score is going to be at mm -hmm. the end. And that's how, the way it played out, unfortunately. I just want to congratulate Senator Mitt Romney for voting his conscience and character. <laughs> but he was the, the lone Republican to do so, which was disappointing but not wholly surprising. We have to bring the country together, solve the problems that got Donald Trump elected in the first place. That's how we're going to defeat him in the fall. So um, I see you're wearing your math pin. Yes. Right. Did you offer uh, some help with math to the Democrats in Iowa this past week? Oh, my gosh. One reason I am pumped to be here in New Hampshire <laughs> is you all are going to vote February 11th. And you know when we're going to find out the results? February 11th. <laughs> oh. So I guess that's a no. I mean, you know, it, I mean, it's very, I feel for the, the Democrats and the people of Iowa, uh, but the, the fact is this was really an avoidable error that shot the party in the foot. And it's going to be harder to convince Americans that we can entrust massive systems with government if we can't count votes on the same night in a way that's clear, transparent, and reliable. Yeah. So listen, I know not 100% well, of the, the count is in, but let me ask you, since we're talking about Iowa, you got 5% uh, of the vote in Iowa during the first round, but you weren't viable in many precincts, which means you earned about 1% of the state delegate equivalent. What happened? What do you think? Well, 5% was about where we were polling when we went in, but Bill Clinton got less than 3% in Iowa in 1992. He went on to do great here in New Hampshire and become president for two terms. We're hoping we can follow in his footsteps. All right. Thank you. So let's move over a little bit this way. So we, there we go. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, sorry, Doc. I just, want to, I just want to make sure you're in your light and that you're in your, look, in well, your best you. light. So uh, <laughs> let's go to the audience. So I want to bring in Hannah Robinson. She's from Bow, New Hampshire. She works in philanthropy and is still undecided in this primary. Hannah, what's your question? Hi, welcome to New Hampshire. There's a shortage of skilled workers, but few ways to obtain a credential without incurring debt. Both traditional aged and adult students must find a career path that provides a good salary and advancement opportunities. Many are given false promises due to unfair recruitment practices at for-profit institutions, resulting in significant student debt and no credential. How do you address this problem and help grow the workforce? Thank you for this question, Hannah. This is something I'm very, very passionate about because we have millions of unfilled jobs in this country that are left wanting for workers with the right technical skills and training to fill these jobs. And many of these jobs are very solid, stable, lucrative, middle-class jobs. On the flip side, you have workers who are trying to gain access to those jobs, but they don't have access to the training from the get-go. One thing I would do as president is I would invest in technical, vocational, and apprenticeship training at the high school levels in New Hampshire and around the country. The fact is only 6% of American high school students are in technical or trade programs right now here in the US. In Germany, that's 59%. So think of that gulf, and think about how many unfilled jobs would go filled if we had the right people with the right skills, and all of the young people that right now are getting steered towards college that would, would be better served by heading into the trades and technical and apprenticeship programs. So this is a nationwide problem that we need to invest billions, tens of billions of dollars in on the federal level and say to communities, if you want to build a vocational or trade or apprenticeship program, we will help you do so. Owen Culberson is here. He's right there to your left. He's a high school student who works part time at a local grocery store. First time voter says he's undecided. So I'm going to work go. on you. Owen, go ahead. <laughs> You can only vote for a candidate who has answered a question personally. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yang. So your policy of an American universal basic income, or freedom dividend, has come under criticism for those who claim it may undercut key federal assistance programs, such as Social Security and Medicaid. How would you reassure voters who depend on these programs that their needs will be met? Will their needs be met? Well, thank you for the question. As most of you know, my flagship proposal is a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for every American adult starting at age 18. So how old are you now? I am 17, going on 18. Oh, my gosh. So imagine your 18th birthday. President Yang says freedom dividend time, and you're getting 1000 bucks a month. Everyone in your <laughs> class getting 1000 bucks a month. In your senior year in high school, you have a financial literacy class to help you 
decide how you're going to make use of this income when it starts coming in. This would be a game changer and actually make it so our economy works for young people. Because right now, we have to face facts. We are stacking the deck against our young people much, much more seriously than has ever been the case in this country. If you were born in the United States in the 1990s, you're down to a 50-50 shot of doing better than your parents, and it's declining fast. So we need to turn that around for you and your generation. The last thing I would do is want to take resources away from Americans who are relying upon existing programs. I want to do more for Americans. I want to build a foundation that we can all be confident in and then continue to build a structure on top of that. So the last thing I would do is reduce existing benefits. I want to add to them to make sure we can live the kind of lives that we deserve here in this country. All right. Uh, Chris Potter is here. He's a community organizer. He's uh, for rights and democracy. He's from Manchester, and he says he's currently undecided as well. Hi, Chris. Hey, Mr. Yang. Welcome back to New Hampshire. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I absolutely love New Hampshire. Uh, this is my home. It is under threat from climate change, though. We already have regularly sunny day flooding on the seacoast. Our winter sports industry is under threat. I'm worried that our whole ecosystem will be destabilized within my lifetime. So given that fossil fuel use is the primary driver of climate change, what will you do to phase out fossil fuels as quickly as possible? Well, thank you for the question, Chris. I actually went to high school here in the state. I graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy in 1992, and my first time skiing was here in the state. So when you talk about how transforming climate is actually going to gut some of the tourism industries here in the state, those are actually some of my finest childhood memories. Climate change is devastating regional economies right here in New Hampshire. When I was in Portsmouth, I saw buildings that were flooding regularly. I saw a shrimping business that was shrinking fast because the warming waters are killing the shrimp. So we have to acknowledge that we're already on the curve of climate change. When politicians talk about preventing climate change, I get frustrated because you can't prevent something that is already here and having disastrous effects around the country. So I would zero out the billions and billions of dollars of subsidies that are going to these fossil fuel companies that are way, way past their sell-by date. I would take those subsidies, move them to wind and solar, and then I would put a price on carbon immediately so that polluters actually have to pay into a system that will help reduce emissions. The toughest part of this, Chris, is that the United States of America is only 15% of global emissions. So even if we were to aggressively get our emissions down, you're still going to face a warming planet over time because 85% of emissions are coming from outside our borders. And what's happening in Africa right now is that China is showing up with coal-burning power plants and saying, what do you think? And then what is the African government saying in response? Yes, I'll take it, because they don't care about emissions. They just want energy as cheaply as possible. So if we're going to get our arms around this problem in a realistic way, we have to be at that table with the African government saying, do not take this coal-burning power plant. Take these solar panels instead, and we will subsidize them to the level where it will be a no-brainer for you. That's the direction we need to go, and that's where I would lead as president. You have you got two young sons, right? How old are they? Yes, I have two uh, young boys, Chris, Christopher and Damien. They're seven and four. Okay, so they're going to be dealing with the climate crisis more than our generation. Do you talk to them about it? And if so, how do you do that? I have not talked to them about climate change yet. Uh, my, my kids are kind of oblivious, honestly. I tell them that Daddy has a very big deadline on Tuesday. <laughs> and he'll be traveling. Uh, so right now, they don't even know that I'm running for president or I have a real understanding of what that means. They but are just, you going to talk to Because this, this is something that you'll have to talk to them. Like, you know, you got to talk about the birds and the bees. You're probably going to have to talk to them about climate change. Have you decided? Have you thought about that? Don, Don, Don where do you get these parents? <laughs> <laughs> it's like birds and the bees. My kids are seven and four. What are you talking about? Uh, I mean, I, I think at this point, many children will be exposed to lessons about climate change during their school, yeah. in, a, in elementary school, grade school. But if they don't know by the time they get to a certain age, of course I'll sit down with them and let them know that we have left them a total mess and we are sorry and daddy's going to do his best to clean it up for them and every other family in this country. All right. Sophia Menke is here. She is a, you're a student, let's see, student here. I'm not sure if she's a, what year you are, but she's a student here at St. Anselm and she's undecided by the way, so there you go. Welcome to New Hampshire. Well, Hi. welcome back to New Hampshire. Thank you, Sophia. If you had to choose between economic reform and social reform, which one would you pursue? I love this question. So to, to me, both of these things reinforce each other 
in various ways. So let's say you wanted to improve educational outcomes in the United States of America, which all of us want to do. One thing you could do is invest in schools, which we should obviously do. We should pay teachers more. A good teacher is worth their weight in gold. But then when you look at the data, you find that two-thirds of our kids' educational outcomes are based on non-school factors like parental income, parental time spent with them at home before they show up to school, stress levels in the household. So if you were to put money into that family and household, you would actually be enhancing that child's ability to learn when they show up to school. So the reason I point this out is that social goals often are related to economic goals, where if you put more money into families' hands, you can actually do things like improve graduation rates, improve mental health, uh, decrease domestic violence, things that we would feel very strongly about. And one thing I am confident of, New Hampshire, is that it's easier to amend and modify our capital flows in this country than it is to get into people's minds, bodies, souls, and somehow t change their attitudes about each other. Like, if we get the economics right, then I believe many of the social problems that we care so deeply about will actually change along with our balancing out an economy that's become the most extreme winner-take-all economy in the history of the world, and it's going to get more extreme as we go on unless we change it right now, and that's why I'm running for president. Let's talk a little bit more about the economy, because there's a new poll that was out yesterday from Gallup. 63% of Americans approve of how this president, President Trump, is handling the economy. That is a high for him. How do Democrats, how do you run against that? Well, when I talk to families here in New Hampshire, they know that we have record high corporate profits right now in the United States. What else are at record highs in the United States right now? Suicides, stress, anxiety, mental illness, student loan debt, for those of you who are in school here, medical bankruptcies, Record lows in the United States right now, starting a business for a young person, getting married, having a child. The fact is 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck and almost half can't afford an unexpected $500 bill in the good times. The vast majority of the new jobs we're creating in this economy are temp, gig, or contract jobs that do not have meaningful benefits and often don't have a path forward. If you are a college graduate, and you recently came out of school, there's a 40 to 44% chance you're gonna do a job that does not require a college degree. And does the school come back and say, hey, we'll forgive your loans in that case? No, of course not. So this economy, again, is the most extreme winner-take-all economy in the history of the world, and many, many Americans do not feel like they're being included in the gains. And when you ask Americans what else are at record highs in this country, we all know that all of these terrible social ills are at record highs right now, because even as the companies do better, we do not feel those gains in our own families and our own communities. Deborah Kanopka is here. She is a network operations technician from Amherst. She says she is supporting Senator Sanders. Deborah. Hello, Mr. Yang. Uh, do you feel that you are the best equipped candidate to beat President Trump on the debate stage, and why? Thank you for this question. I love it so much, because the number one criteria that Democratic primary voters have for the nominee is what? Beat Donald Trump. That's right. And here's why I am the best person to beat Donald Trump in the general election. So I'm a numbers guy in New Hampshire, and people who are betting their hard-earned money on these head-to-head -head matchups have me as the heaviest betting favorite against Donald Trump in the general election. I'm the three to two favorite. Everyone else, including Bernie, is at best even money. So why is it that people think I'm the best, toughest matchup? Because 18% of college Republicans said they would choose me over Donald Trump in the general election. Because 10% of New Hampshire Trump voters in one poll said that they would choose me over Trump in the general election. You know who has already figured out that I'm his toughest matchup? Donald Trump. I am the only candidate in the field he has not tweeted a word about. And he has not tweeted a word about me for two reasons. Number one, he knows I'm better at the internet than he is. <laughs> And number two, his most potent attacks are that you're a corrupt DC politician and none of this stuff works on me. One of his advisors was quoted in a, in a meeting that was caught on film saying the candidate they're most worried about is Andrew Yang. And as more Democrats realize that I am the candidate that's best situated to defeat Donald Trump soundly in the general election, the stronger this campaign will grow and the more likely I become the nominee. 
Thank you. All right. So uh, let's, let's talk about it. the only, Mr. Yang, the only Democrat who's debated President Trump is Secretary Clinton, right? And she said that he stood behind her. She wrote that he stood behind her during a debate. And this is a quote, literally breathing down my neck, my skin crawled. She said that, right? I'm quoting. What do you do if he tries to intimidate you on stage? Well, I think I make an incredible foil for Donald Trump uh, because, like, I can make him seem ridiculous. Uh, certainly, if he breathes down my neck, I would look around and I would just like laugh at him, and and uh, my uh, my energy I think contrasts very very nicely with him, where he's all bluster uh, and braggadocio. I'm like Spock and ice to his fire. <laughs> but the main reason why Trump voters are coming my way is that. I'm laser focused on solving the problems that got him into the White House to begin with. The fact that many Americans feel left behind, the fact that we blasted away 4 million manufacturing jobs in the swing states that Trump needed to win, and that we need to actually rewrite the rules of this economy so that everyone feels included. Because the fact is technology is getting stronger, faster, more capable all the time, and we are not. Aside from the young people in this room, most of the adults feel fortunate just to not get dumber on any given day. If we can find our keys, that was a good day. <laughs> but the technology is ramping up faster and faster. It has already eliminated 4 million manufacturing jobs in the Midwest and is in the process of transforming economies right here in New Hampshire and around the country. As Amazon alone closes 30% of your stores and malls, retail clerks the most common job in the economy, and 30% of those jobs are disappearing as we speak. You want to stick around for a little bit? Of course All not. All right. Well, uh, we're going to be right back with more from presidential candidate Andrew Yang right after this.